Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Uh, today starts our part one of two series of our East Coast Rep Rap Fest coverage. Uh, we had a lot of fun at this event, and I'm excited to share all these interviews with you. So here we go. So this is Joe and Aaron here with Makers on Tap with... Greg, Greg from E3D. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't know I was supposed to talk when you point at me. It's a it's Sunday and we're all tired and it's uh-huh. it's been a it's been a weekend, but you here have the latest revision of the tool changer here. Yeah, the production machine with a little tweak to it, and um, I'm excited to see it. It looks slightly different than my machine. Yeah, well, what, we'll, we'll get you upgraded soon. What's what's new? Uh, we have a prototype Hermes mounted to the machine. Uh, currently in uh, Formlabs rigid uh, resin, but yeah, it's uh, it's on the machine. It was originally designed from the start or to take four Hermes, so they fit on there pretty well. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, that's good to know. So the Hermes was. So semi announced this weekend. It was announced at TCT. It was announced at TCT. Yep. But for those that are uninitiated, it's a super compact aero version, and maybe we'll try to catch Sanjay or Josh and talk more about that later. But it's a really good implementation for the tool changer because it is so compact mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. like light and light, a nice, uh, yeah. Yeah. very short filament path. It's quite light. It's got a lot of power behind it, uh, and it fits quite well onto the tool changer dock areas. Yeah, and it. It's got a nice like center of gravity. It's it's barely bigger than the tool changer head itself, so that you don't have a big mass hanging out in front of it, like some printers yeah. that I used to spend a lot of time on. And so you don't do you lose a lot of speed carrying the Hermes around? Not really. It's it, it's 465 grams, so it's not massively heavy. It's under our sort of max me- recommended weight, which is 500 grams. Okay. Um, be sensible with it. You'll be okay. Uh, I don't really turn anything down. Maybe just adjust the jerk a little bit, but apart from that, it's it nice. runs all right. Yeah, you can still throw it around. Awesome. And then the other thing I noticed on this tool changer is there's a new 24 volt bed on that. What's what's with that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's that's the very power bed, which will be coming soon. It's very similar to the very power bed that I have. Uh, it it but, is, yes. But, but, not, uh, but you're, there's probably four years difference between the one that you've got and the one that we're coming out. Yes. So we've got an electrical engineer that works for us now. Uh, he's been here for a while now, Jeremy. Uh, and he, it's his first sort of big thing that we threw at him and said, fix this. So, uh, yeah, the, the, I think the production parts are in, in, in route at the minute. Nice. So we should have, uh, yeah, the, the, the very power bed is coming back into stock. Awesome. Yeah, I like the 24 volt beds just because you don't have to deal with mains power and there's no relays, so you have a little bit of less of a concern. And for the most part, they print everything. Like, I, I very rarely run into a situation where I can't get my 24 volt bed up to temp, as long as you have a power supply with the oomph to push it. Yeah, the, the, it, it, we're rating them as we did with the previous ones up to 125, so uh, yeah, you can stick anything on there. Yeah. But the only thing you can't do on those ones is peak, which, of course, you'll need our high-temperature beds for that. Yeah, that's a whole different animal. And mm-hmm. Even I haven't tried peak. <laughs> so. Good stuff. So the tool changer is available for sale now, right? Yes, uh, although we're still working through our uh, pre-order queue, which we hope should be done by the end of December. But, yes, we're, okay. you can still join the queue and get in front of everybody else that's waiting. So now that it's kind of available for sale and people are going to start getting more of them, what are you most excited for with, for the future of the, your, um, your tool changer platform? Uh, I'm hoping that more software engineers will jump on board and bring the, the sort of the firmware and the slicer technology forward. Uh, there's a, a huge amount of potential in not just the 3D printing side of things, but in the subtractive and uh, in-process inspection. Currently, there is no software for that at the minute. So we're hoping that as, as more people get involved, that, that, that that'll, that'll catch up with the hardware. Uh, certainly, uh, the one that gets me excited is the subtractive one. That, that's going to be really cool to see. Mm-hmm. Awesome. awesome. 
all of the files for the retail version of the tool changer are, are open now, right? Yep, we've released it under GPL3. It's on uh, yes. GitHub. Uh, you it. can do whatever you like with it as long as you say I uh, release it under the same uh, license when you do any modifications. But you can even commercialize it if you want. I mean, it is completely open. Awesome. Well, thanks for your time, Greg. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for letting us hang out in the booth. That's cool. <laughs> cool. Good to have <laughs> you. Everything I hear like all weekend so far. <laughs> all right. All right. Cool. Um, hi. Hi. This is Joe with Makers on Tap. And Aaron's with me. He's going to interrupt me at some point. And we have... Ooh, I'm Andre Prusa. <laughs> Is it at the top? <laughs> so I not, nailed it. Nailed not it. Andre Prusa. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry. Andre just walked by. It was... Yeah. It just... This is Sunday morning, and it's been a long weekend, and everybody's kind of loopy and fun. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to get the best interviews this morning. Oh, the finest. The, the finest. The finest. You can probably hear my voice audio quality is dropping, but... So yeah. if you don't recognize them from past, past episodes, this is Sanjay. Hi. From E3D. That's me. Correct UID. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. So Sanjay had... You're, you had your wonderful, like, deep dive technical talk yesterday, and we dove into Hermes. Yeah, I hope that was, like, on the, it was quite wondering. Oh, it was that, fine. I, yeah. It was exactly what everyone expects from you at good, this point. Good, good, okay, fine. It, yeah. Good, bad, or indifferent. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love watching you talk, because that's exactly how my talks go, and it makes me feel better, because, okay, like, people good. line up to listen to you. Yeah. And I'm like, well... You know, one of these days we're gonna. There's a ramble onwards. I, I guess. I guess people. I had fun anyway like, because you get to go into the stuff that otherwise, I don't know. Oh, you have to like construct a two minute and twenty seconds or less video for yeah. YouTube with a ten second hook on it, and I'm like, yeah, I put two years of work into this <laughs> uh, as well as you know, <laughs> yes. as did six other people, and you want me to like condense like everything from like you know surface finishes and and, and you're know, like. It's harnesses and material science yeah, and like uh, and no. but that's why you come on our podcast because we yeah, let you ramble for as long as you want uh, and be drunk that's and <laughs> such a privilege yeah <laughs> always a privilege <laughs> yeah so um yeah this weekend you guys like did the american launch of hermes Yes, and, and I suppose so. And, and I've had a Hermes for a little while. Oh, of course you have. And I've of been course. chomping at the bit to finally be able to talk about it. <laughs> yeah. What? <laughs> Nothing. Um, so it, it's exciting to finally get to talk about the Hermes because this is this is another one of those like weirdo projects that we've been talking about for a while. Of, like, yeah. Super compact yeah, yeah. filament paths and uh, uh, really, really... I'm sorry. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Let's, just, let's sidebar this. Oh. Hey, Adrian. How are you doing? Good Privileged good. to have you here. Yeah. Um, have you, you've seen this thing. I, I've seen it. I yeah. Indeed, I think. I well, maybe oh, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. In an earlier state. Um, yeah. This is this is Joe's um, Hello. <laughs> oh, sorry. As in, this machine is Joe's. Oh, sorry. And this Hello, is Joe. Joe. Yeah. Hello, Joe. Yeah. Um, I mean, you are yeah. Sure, sort of. Yeah. Um, Mildly. Yeah, whatever. But yeah, Joe is printing glasses with flexures and right. support material wow. all together. Yeah. So um, this this was our functional tool changer demo. Like we we make real parts, not just um, you know. RC truggy tires with wheels. Yeah, actual functional parts. Um, and this kind of material combo here is, is really cool. Yeah, picture. <laughs> um, because we've got um, XTCF20, which is, um, it's like a PT, PCTG, it's a polyester. Um, and we've also got a polyester-based elastomer for the, um, for the flexures, and then a soluble support material that adheres to the elastomers. So, I think that should be good. Adrian, I, I feel like this is the one chance I'm going to get a chance to grab you. So we run a maker or a podcast called Makers on Tap, right. and we try to ca capture the essence of making and not the products of making. And like, like we have Sanjay on for hours at a time, just rambling about the things that he loves. Can yeah. can I get like a like a minute of talking to you on the podcast? Okay. 
Yeah. Not ours, but you can get a minute. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. for our listeners that don't know, this is Adrian. Hello. Why are, why are you great? Um, why am I so excited I wouldn't, to talk to you? I wouldn't <laughs> presume to say. Um, I did start the RetRap project, uh, which is the thing that changed the course of 3D printing, perhaps one might say if one wasn't modest, but I wouldn't say that because I am. Yeah. <laughs> so you changed the RepRap pro or you started the RepRap project, which changed the course of my career. Oh, well, I, I'm, I apologize in that case. but <laughs> No, no, in a very good way. <laughs> oh, good, um, good. But I love the philosophy you have behind releasing projects. Right. Like, especially your, your current project. Like Aaron and I have actually right. covered it a few times on the show. All right. And as you release updates, we nerd out about it. I don't understand it much, <laughs> but I love the, the philosophy you have of, I'm going to release all of this yes. as well, I can go so people can build. Yes. Well, that's, I, I mean, what the great advantage from my perspective is, well, there are two advantages. Uh, one is that if I make mistakes, people spot them and that stops me wasting time. Um, the other, of course, is that by giving this sort of stuff away, um, other people might take it on and, and work with it, thereby because I'm a lazy sort of chap, uh, allowing me to sit back and do nothing. So uh, I, <laughs> there we go. And, and we know, based on the place that we're at, that that's a proven methodology. <laughs> well, quite so, yes. There seem to be an awful lot of people here who w I guess wouldn't be here if I hadn't uh, released Rep Rap originally. Yeah, I, I mean, very definitely. Mm. At least maybe not in the same sense that we're seeing. No, no, um, I think With you're the right. same level of community and... Because that's 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 what these shows are all about. Is of course. Everybody is here sharing and building on one another's accomplishments and yeah. like lifting each other up. Yeah, kind of I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree. So, um, is, was there anything at the show this weekend that you saw that was just like, ah? Uh, one, one or two things, which I'm not going to mention, because... What the problem is that having a, a just a little bit of fame and, and standing in all of this, if I mention one thing and not another, then it looks as if I'm endorsing it or whatever. So, so I, I have a policy of, of never endorsing a particular printer and, and never promoting one thing above another, if, if you see what I mean. I have a huge amount of respect for that. Okay, good. So <laughs> thank you. Um, I, I'll let you get back to your show. I don't want to tie up your time. That's um, okay. It's a pleasure to I'm, talk to you. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. You, you better have a microphone then. I know. Otherwise, they'll only hear the answer. We're Go not on. great at sharing. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been following your electric printing project for the past yeah. couple months, and I'm super excited about it. Uh, well, um, yeah, I, I don't get overexcited. I have no <laughs> idea if it's going to work or not. So go on. <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, it usually takes me a couple of read-throughs of each blog post to fully comprehend it. What do you... Given your current progress, what are you most excited about for that project? Well, the idea I like uh, is the idea that we could have a 3D printer which quite literally had no moving parts whatsoever. Right, yeah. It was entirely dependent on the movement of electrons and ions like a, like a computer. Yeah. Um, and uh, that, if one could make it work, would, I think, be a little bit special. Um, it would be incredibly reliable, apart from yes. anything else. Uh, nothing to wear out. Mm -hmm. uh, just keep working forever. Um, but, of course, the enormous thing that's in the way is that we don't know whether it's going to work at all or not. Uh, all I've done at the moment is done some simple mathematical simulations. Um, we have no physical hardware at all. So that will be the step where things start to get difficult, I expect. Okay. Yeah. I'm excited to see what you come up with because, well, yeah. man, it'd, it'd be something if, if, it could, if it could prove that it works. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It, w it would be, it would be, it would be fun. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll definitely keep an eye on it in case anything, in case you, you you figure the thing out where, if we can put some hardware together just to test it. Yeah, I'll be first in line to throw the thing together to, to see if it. Did I, I think the f before even we get to building hardware to print anything, the first experiments will need to be done on the actual material that we the, need the, to the need to create. Stuff. Yes, yeah. basically, what we want is a material that um, will. Uh, polymerize spontaneously but which you can reverse that polymerization by passing an electric current through it in other words uh, as i mentioned in my talk a bit like loctite which depolymerizes when you expose it to oxygen what we want is something equivalent that depolymerizes when you pass electricity through it or mm -hmm. possibly 
through um, a gel consisting of it and an electrolyte. In other words, it's much easier, of course, to get electrolyte solutions to conduct electricity than it is to get polymers to conduct electricity. So maybe the first thing we'll be working with is some sort of gel, I expect. Okay. Do you have anything else? He, he's know. lost for questions. Right. Yeah. I'm Aaron, by okay. the way. Oh, hello. Nice to, nice to meet <laughs> Introdu you in person. Introduction at the end. Oh, why yes. not? <laughs> yes. We're also bad at those. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm sure you can edit that round, so it's, uh, yes. it's okay. We were mid-interview with Sanjay. But, but now Sanjay's run away. Now we're mid-interview with you. But now Sanjay's run away. It's going to be like the most crazy... This will be every, the funnest, <laughs> funnest segment ever to edit. Maybe we won't edit it at all. Don't edit it. Don't edit it. Just go, <laughs> go, go with the, the flow. I, I wouldn't. Know if we did or not. I wouldn't. I wouldn't edit it. I think it's crazy. No, like he, everybody, every guest has had that one. Cool. It's like going around a trade show in real life. You end up with random conversations with random people, and then you get interrupted randomly, and you have to take every moment of the conversation and enjoy it because it might end at any second. Yes. So good. what were we talking about? <laughs> All the, well, first, I'll see if I can pick up. First, who are you? I'm Josh from E3D. Josh Rowley. Yes. Sanjay's business partner. And one of my favorite people. Uh, well, I love you too, Joe. We've been we've been hanging out at the at the the rep rap fest since the beginning, and I, I'm gutted that I don't get to see enough of you. He, you keep threatening to come over to the UK, but uh, it's uh, it it's yet to materialize. It's yet to materialize so far. I it, needs, it really needs to happen. It, yeah, yeah. This year it was. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> so we were talking a little bit about Hermes and why Hermes is exciting, why it matters. Yep. Yep. Um, and. Um, yeah, what 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 has you excited about Hermes? Um, I'm excited about Hermes because it's like a it's a next step. Um, you know, for us, um, Titan was a Titan was great. It was a it's a cool kind of first entry into the extruder world. Um, but now with the kind of economies of scale, we can use cool technologies like metal injection molding, so we can make so we can make the thing all metal basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've gone we've we've upped the ante a bit. Gone for dual drive gears. We've gone for a slightly higher gearing ratio. We redid we, we remade the motor from scratch, right? So we made our own custom faceplate, all to just try and save space. We we're just like, okay, cool. We've learned a lot about hot ends. We've learned a lot about extruders. Let's just take the best of what we know about both and put it into one thing. Yeah. Um, and just for people that are making printers, we hope that it makes life easier. Um, and it does. That, yeah. Like, the mounting. The mounting of all things. It just makes things so much better. Because you, you don't have the interstitial layer that you have to build in. With, I'm so like, sorry. The arrow. Well, you know, it was, it was, it was better than a Wade's. <laughs> it had to be precisely two millimeters thick. <laughs> if it was any thinner, then you know the screws would bottom out inside the motor faceplate. If it was too thick, the screws wouldn't be long enough. Like your your screws had to be like the precise length for that interstitial. Yeah. Well, I I will say that uh, Hermes isn't much different. Um, That's true. Ba That's true. Based with the screw on the lengths. design that I've done, I'm, I'm really I I have some concerns. That's and, true. And we've talked about them, but they're not huge concerns. They, it, it's just a, the the mount distance that you have between uh, the T-slots on the Hermes and mm. the face of your bolt, it needs to be precise. Absolutely, but I think it's, it's still a little bit easier because yes. whereas on the, on the Titan you had to have, like, you had specific screws and you couldn't just like, get those screws off the shelf. Yeah. And they had, like, you couldn't just add a washer if it was too thick. No. You, could, like, you had to, or too thin rather, you had to, like, they had, the screws had to be the right size. At least with the Hermes, if your screw's a bit too long, you can just put a couple of washers under it. Yes. Um, so I'd say, Definitely swings around, but beyond, anyway, beyond the mounting, which I think is definitely a small improvement, the um, a major improvement, the, it's just being able to have like what is it a forty millimeter bolt square? Dual, dual drive half the distance from the from the wheels to the melt zone means it handles flexibles like an absolute ninja. Um, no, no pun, <laughs> no pun intended. intended. The actual, like, distance of travel. Yeah, twelve it, mil. And if you're a machining nerd like me, taking it apart was a joy. Yeah. yeah, everything was so nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but creating the drawings and the inspection drawings and the inspection programs where like the heat sink and all the parts and the tolerance stack, much less fun. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I bet. Yeah, I don't want to do that. Maybe I do. That, that's why if you, if you look at the Hermes heat break, it actually has that, that ring mm -hmm. or the, like whatever you want to call it, the disc at the bottom because that is the there's an inspection dimension from there from the top face of that 
disc to the tip of the heat brake on the cold side. Okay. And so we can control that dimension very accurately. And then there's a like a matching face on the on the Hermes, which is why you see that disc like screws into a little pocket. And then that is tolerance up to the pockets that then the bearings for the drive gears sit into. And that's how you get that whole to tolerance stack of the heat brake screwing right up to the gear, the drive teeth. Um, and that is a nightmare, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm super pumped for it because, you know, as Joe, as you were saying, like you just grab it, you strap it on a printer and then it works. There's no like, yeah. what am I going to do for an extruder? What am I going to do for a hot? It's just like, okay, there's one thing yeah. and it's going to be very, it's going to be very affordable for everyone that wants to use it. Um, it should yeah. take the hassle out of it. And also like the barrier to entry much reduced as well, because we'll mm. be able to deliver these to you as like an assembled, ready to go, like insert filament and yeah. off you run. And so you don't have to get into the, like, oh, um, how am I, we're tight. You had to figure out in your head how you're going to mount it and then pre-print your parts and, like, be ready and, like, go through this, like, risk analysis cycle of I'm about to take my printer apart now and probably break it and then I won't have a printer to fix it, et cetera. Like, that's the whole, like, forward <laughs> planning cycle. Anyway, that's all gone because you get the little, like, black box that is Hermes and it just works yeah. and you bolt it to the thing. And it comes, it can come fully assembled, serial numbered, tested, with the inspection data. Yeah, it's it's a big it's a big like step forward in just usability and not being a pain. Yeah. So, um, in your talk, you you mentioned uh, user experience a lot with how you design this, and that kind of blew my mind. Just as a software engineer, we we have to take that into consideration a lot as far as you know user interfaces. I never really considered that to be something you would incorporate into a hardware, you know, just because I'm not a physical engineer. Yeah, well, I, I suppose um, software UI design, um, in fact, borrows a great deal from you know hardware UI design that came beforehand, mm -hmm. um, and so you know, in the kind of product design and affordances, and the types of interactions and the shapes that one uses for you know, knobs that push, pull, and the affordances that you add to those things. And so there's actually quite a lot of literature on like good user-centric design of hardware um, that, that came a long time back. And you see these like little influences actually in software, you know, yeah. in like your toggle switches and the states and the, the things and these kind of analogs that we have. And so, yeah, I suppose in many ways, software has been the, the, the secondary. Yeah, oh, no, it totally is, yeah, because software's only been around for, like, what, 30 years-ish? Yeah. Engineering's been around for hundreds, thousands, ever, years. Since we made a rock into a hammer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I love the amount of um, detail you put into the Hermes as far as, the, like, the heat sink, spiraling the air outwards, yeah. upwards, um, machining the mounting face um, of the Hermes yeah. so it's a perfectly flat, rigid mount. Yeah. That was really neat. The, you know the, the the microns of clearance with the heat break to get a, a, a really constrained filament path. All that stuff put together, what 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 are you most excited about for the Hermes platform going forward? Mm. Do you have an answer? Good answer. Um, I I think that the ability to it, like I think there's something that people it's it's hard to quantify but it's the accuracy of extrusion. Um, so having really accurate stops and starts where you don't have this big startup blob, mm -hmm. and then when you stop extruding the long kind of tail, and that means that you're like, your seams are tighter, your holes are more accurate and rounder. Mm -hmm. um, again, hard to quantify, but things like, you know, the kind of wibble um, of your extrusion as you go by because of the all the many different things like the pole count on the motor and micro stepping and stuff like that we've spent a lot of time like nudging that in mm -hmm. um, and there's still actually a bunch of cool stuff that we might do in the future um, but extrusion accuracy has a come a long way with Hermes and we have the opportunity to go even further so I'm, I'm pretty pumped about that yeah yeah so you uh, you design this from the from the um, context of what sucks about extruding right now and how can we make it better? Yeah. Do you guys have your sights on any other aspects of printing that sucks that you would like to improve in the future? Um, well, I don't think the hot ends suck, but I think that V6 has been around for a very long time and has been iterate, like, you know, incremental change. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we made the 
lots better. We change how the thermistors are. I, it goes forward and like we, over time as we get more data, we like hammer out these little reliability issues and improve things. Um, but I'm confident that Hermes should like really create a great platform for filament driving. Um, and that will give us some time to now switch focus back to hot ends. Um, and what really makes a hot end a hot end and what does the use case for hot ends look like in the future? Because the, the type of user and the use case that V6 was built for mm -hmm. back like three, four years ago, I can't even remember now, um, is very, very different to mm -hmm. the type of printer user that we're now catering for. And even just things like the basic manufacturing volumes, like V6 was built to be made in the low hundreds, whereas now we're making them in the yeah. hundreds of thousands, like we're up three orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. And so the, how you make things on that scale is very, very, should be very, very different. But we're still making V6 in broadly the same way. Um, so I think that there's a lot of work we have left to do there. Awesome. Yeah, particularly in the usability side of yeah. things. I think the us usability is one of the things that needs a lot of improvements um, with all with all hot ends, really. Mm -hmm. um, you know, making them... Uh, Good. <laughs> Just trying to make your life editing this really, really easy. You know, yeah. we've switched microphones any number of times. <laughs> like, you know, conversations, not speaking into the microphone. It's going to be great. No, no, but I mean, usability, I think, is is going to be a, a big, it's a big area for improvement that we're currently pursuing. Um, so, watch the space over the next few months. Yeah. Is there anything that really excited you guys this weekend at the show? I really enjoyed the grandfather clock. I thought that was very cool, and the, also the the the, the lithograph. Not the what do you what do you call it? The color the color printing with the layers, the CMY. Uh, yeah, Jason Priestess and Jason, stuff. Like yeah, that yeah, is so cool. I'm very very impressed with that. Also, the most rep wrap 3D printer of ever, which yeah. I, again I don't know the name of it, but the the giant Piper tool changer. No, 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 no. The no, the, 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 fully the, the fully printed everything, oh, like everything oh, from gosh. a printed belt, printed carriage, printed bearings, printed. Like lead screws, like that's pretty pretty badass. Um, I was very impressed by that. Also, the guy, the fact that the Protopasta are running their own extrusion line and holding like some pretty sick tolerances, just at a trade show. I haven't gone to see is, that yet. It's kind to of go do that. yeah, that's actually kind of impressive. Um, I, I really enjoyed seeing Jubilee from Josh Vasquez um, and that whole platform and the way it's been, the way he's thought about it and his like application of like almost software development thought and separation of concerns and, and things like that really goes takes kind of the primordial thoughts of what we were doing with like the tool changer and the motion system and them being separate things and really like crystallizes and solidifies that and he's created an absolutely fantastic tool changing system that's compatible with ours um, but uses a totally novel like um, you know the prime mover transmission concept with cable drives and stuff. Really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and, and generally, uh, just the number of tool changing 3D printers that are, are here. You know, it's only been one year since we stood up on a stage, you know, a year, 18 months, something like that, since we stood up on a stage and went, here's a tool changing 3D printer, here are the problems that we had, here's how we solved them please do go out and make your own. And uh, here we are, and there's tons of tool-changing 3D printers. Yeah. And that's really exciting. Did, did you see the one that was made from the medical pick-and-place machine that yes. has, like, the hot and index? Yes, yeah, yeah, the rotary kind of microscopy. It's so cool. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, super interesting. Um, All right. Um, oh, oh, and also the, the, the huge... Half wooden, half aluminium. Yes. Ten tools. We he he won ten, the, ten, is it the ten? Like I think it's the, twelve. Twelve, twelve tools. Tool the, changer. Running off of a handful of ramps, boards, and clipper. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, and how clipper the does the whole like the the synchronization and the timing and the like quasi hard real time. Yeah, that, yeah. That's 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 hardcore. Yeah. That. He, he won our first Hold My Beer Award on the show a few months ago. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I so. enjoy that. And also, I, I, I'm pretty excited about the, um, the Prusa Mini because yeah. I think that um, while, yeah, the, there's all the kind of crealities and the, in, in that price range, uh, he's chosen a very like 
compact but simple machine design. And what I'm really excited about is like print farms mm -hmm. and the amount of printer you can buy. I, a lot of companies come to us and ask, we want to make a printer that prints faster so we can do production. And what, what we end up kind of saying to them is actually you're looking at like your productivity per dollar. Um, and that doesn't matter whether it's done on one machine or 10 machines. In fact, if it's done on 10 machines, it's kind of better because you, you paralyzation and yeah. you can you, know, you can switch things up more easily. You, you don't have one, you don't have all your eggs in one basket on one machine. Yeah. And so that like productivity per dollar on that machine, because you know that because it's a Prusa machine, it's going to have great yield, yeah. great reliability. Um, and you've got that integrated software tool chain that's been developed from scratch and all the support and stuff to back it up, along with a really, really high like productivity per dollar price point. Yeah, that for making print farms is that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah, I agree with, with all of that. I'm specifically excited about the little 32-bit real-time controller mm. that's on it, though. Yeah, yeah, like, mm. that's real nice. Yeah. You should go and talk to Macal about that. He knows it inside out. It's we talked his baby. a little bit about it yesterday, like right during the launch, and he seemed very overwhelmed. So we walked away. Yeah, I figured I'd come yeah, talk yeah. to him today. Yeah, so he's a great guy. Yeah, yes. All right. Well, we have taken up far more than the five minutes I promised. Uh, uh, always, I have <laughs> yes. a habit of doing that. We both do. Yes, but uh, this is great having you guys. It's been awesome being in your booth all weekend. Ah. Do you have anything you want to add? I miss you. I look forward to seeing you again soon. We haven't spoken in ages. We I'm sorry. To the UK. Yeah, you should I, come. We, 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 we want to have you over in England. That would be great. You know, you're I, welcome. You're welcome. It'll anytime. be fun. I would love to be there. We need to work that out. It's emotional, Joe. <laughs> All right, guys. This was <laughs> Joe and Sanjay and Josh and Aaron and Adrian Boyer. Holy crap! Uh, <laughs> keeping it weird. Keeping it weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, this is Aaron from Makers on Tap, and uh, who are you? Hi, I'm John Pickens. I uh, have two RepRap projects here at the show. One is the uh, Woodstock Delta printer, which is a derivative of the original Rostock Delta from mm -hmm. Johan Rochal, um, which is a thing on Thingiverse. And my Woodstock Delta printer is also a thing. It's a remix of the original, so it has all the attribution of, mm -hmm. to the original and everything yep. the way it's supposed to be done. And um, the other project is a uh, uh, open source laboratory auto sampler, it's specifically for testing uh, 40 milliliter glass vials for volatile organic hydrocarbons. Yeah, this, this thing looks awesome. Yeah, it's it's really basically a motion platform with like a, a machine gun belt for moving the vials sequentially one after the other into the process, and then a, a series of valves and syringes for sucking the sample out of the vial and. Uh, spiking it with a uh, calibration standard and then delivering it to the next step of the process. Um, the commercial versions of these machines run about $33,000 and I've put this together uh, for around $1,500 worth of parts. And most of the parts are these uh, uh, sampling valves which are inert Teflon and they cost about $100 a piece. Um, that's, you know, the, that's, there's seven of those so that's you know, 700 bucks right there. The rest is just stepper motors. I'm using a, uh, a Roomba derivative open source uh, board. I'm using a Raspberry Pi for the, to run the upper level software. Um, a PC uh, power supply with a power breakout board and a, a bunch of uh, relays. And that's about it. Pretty, pretty simple. So how did you go about modeling all of the uh, test tube holders and the uh, uh, gears? Uh, I used OpenSCAD or OpenSCAD. I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce it. but uh, Very nice. Yeah, I like OpenSCAD. Well, I really w got exposed to OpenSCAD from the original Rostock project because all of those files were written in OpenSCAD. Mm -hmm. And I really like the ability to modify the open source project using the... Uh, uh, an editable thing. It's also for a, a shared project. It's much better for uh, version control because uh, you can just use a simple text editor to see if your file is the same as the other one or see the changes that were oh, made. Yes. And that's so much more transparent than any of the GUI type systems that I've ever seen. Um, it's not the best CAD program by any means, but yep. it does allow you to do parametric modeling so you can put in uh, variables at the top of your code and 
for instance, this has two different sizes of syringes in it, and the same code was used to ge generate the brackets to hold both syringes. You just put in diameters and thicknesses and so forth, and it just generates the right part for the right yeah. job. Yeah, I agree. You know, OpenSCAD isn't the best CAD software, but for what RepRap stands for, yeah. I believe it is the best as far yeah. as the openness and the sharing and the collaboration. Yeah, everything on, on both of these projects is open source. There's okay. nothing that isn't. So you said that a lot of the uh, uses that you've seen for your syringe pumps that are part of this project. Oh yeah, uh, so I, uh, the syringe pump is a, uh, is a part, a big part of this uh, laboratory auto sampler and I put that up on Thingiverse as its own standalone project and because I needed syringe pumps to, for this project so I was looking for uh, stuff out there on the internet and everything I found was STL files, yeah. which are kind of useless when you want to modify them. So I wrote my own code to generate my own syringe pumps and uh, put that on Thingiverse, and it's been downloaded 1,500 times, and I did a little research, and I believe the biggest user of these things is people who own saltwater aquariums. I'm sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. People who own saltwater aquariums, because they get, like, add three drops per hour of this medicine to your tank. And yeah. So they do sell, you know, you know, you can go to the aquarium store and buy a syringe pump and it's like 1500 bucks. Yes. The cheapest ones I've seen are commercially for laboratory use are around 400 bucks. Yeah. And um, this you can put together with a, a simple controller, a single stepper motor for under 100 bucks. Probably, you know, if you, if you scoot around, probably 50 bucks, you know. Yeah. So, so I'm really curious about turning these in and driving a mister with them because oh. it's very low volume and very high pressure, and that's exactly what I need to drive a mister system for my chameleon. Um, and uh, when you say low volume, is it really that low? Yeah. Okay, you probably would need a heavier walled syringe. You, uh, you were talking about the high pressure. Um, yeah. I think you could get to around 150 PSI with this, but that's really pushing it. I only need yeah. 90. Really? Yeah. It'd be borderline. I mean, these are the cheapest syringes I could get. They're pretty thin walled. There's better syringes out there. Yeah. I wouldn't use glass, but... Uh, uh, I wouldn't necessarily use something that's rated for 90 PSI either. I'm sure you no. could find something that would work that would be inexpensive. But um, this got me really inspired because like, there's um, pump designs where they're dual action piston and you use a series of check valves. So as one's pulling and filling, the other one's yep. pushing and you, you don't end with up those. with pulsing. Yep. And it would be really fun to try to build one of those with a syringe pump. Yeah, um, I think your problems would be leakage past the plunger. And the, the torque, I mean, it's going to put a lot of, well, okay, so if you're using this, that's what's that about, three square centimeters? Yeah. Right? So call it, a, call it a square inch. So that's 15 pounds of force for one atmosphere. And you're talking about uh, four atmospheres. Okay. So that's a lot of force, you know, you add it up. Uh, so maybe a smaller diameter syringe for the lower volume or... The point is, this design you would have to modify. You would probably have to double it up so that you had, uh, uh, how do I put it? Um, so it wouldn't have a lever arm like this. You okay, know? yeah, yeah. So that, because, you know, it's, it's going to, I would think it would break under 50 pounds of force or something like that. So it would be a fun experiment if I get around to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's yeah. the question. Okay. But yeah, I mean, it could be done easily, you know, I'd, piece of cake. Yeah. I, you could take this design. I would probably do a double uh, Z-axis sort of thing. It could be linked together with a belt, piece of cake. So you're pushing on both sides. Yeah. You know, that's if you now if you go to metal, you could probably do it. You know, without all that. But for plastic, you're going to need some some help. You know, yeah. beef it up a bit. This doesn't see any. The the highest pressure this runs at is 30 psi. Okay. And in reality, it's not even the net pressure between atmosphere and what it's doing is probably less than that. So okay. This doesn't have any trouble. But you know, the most force on these would maybe seven or eight pounds at the most so not much all right well and the other, the other thing you'd probably want to gear up your uh, drive yeah you know, put a mul torque multiplier of some kind anyway so with your water testing rig here do you see any other potential applications for it other than just water testing well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the motion platform is just a machine gun belt. I mean, yeah. uh, I had a guy walk up to me who's doing uh, recovery, recycling of lithium ion battery packs. And oh. it's a tedious process. He gets these packs that have like 40 cells in them. He has to break all the welds, 
and he's got to test them all, and mm -hmm. he's got to weld new, um, find the good ones, segregate them, weld them up again, make a new battery pack. And it's a great thing, because you know, a lot of these battery packs with lithium ions, you'll get you know, eight bad cells and 30 good ones, yeah. and it keep, brings the whole thing down, because they're all the way they're wired up. So he was saying, oh, I could use this to, to test, make an auto yeah. tester for my battery packs. And I he said, oh, it. but the diameter's wrong. And I said, well, just change the diameter <laughs> in the code, yes. you know. It's, <laughs> Parameterization. You know. Yeah. So yeah, this, you know, this is a simple, I mean, this is not a, a novel design. There's a lot of machines out there that have this type of delivery system. It's just a, a invalid, involute belt, whatever you call it. So, you know, so it maximizes the space. Um, so, awesome. It's, Thanks for your time. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. This is Aaron from Makers on Tap. And uh, what, who are you and what we got here? My name is Adam Hiley. I've got the Engravenator. It is a uh, small form factor uh, diode laser based uh, laser engraver that's meant to be brought to the workpiece instead of the other way around, as well as just be as compact and lightweight and easy to use as possible. And safe. That's an important thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's such an amazing form factor. Um, it reminds me much of the Ant PCB maker, yep. where it's just a tiny, a tiny, was this, is this 15 by 15 extrusion? It's 20 by 20. 20 by, so it's 20 20 extrusion, little box, uh, Cartesian motion system. But what's neat is it's fully enclosed in the orange uh, laser proof glass for a dial laser. Yep. And the neat. The neatest thing is that you know it's just an engraver. You're not overselling it and calling it a cutter, right? Yeah, I I am a, I'm a Linux guy at heart. Uh, you know, it's what I do on the day job. I like uh, tools that do one thing and do them exceptionally well. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd, I'd rather go with that. Um, yeah. And yeah, you know, you mentioned the Ant PCB. Like, I had a lot of inspirations for this. That project was one of them. The Proust is obviously one of them. Uh, I also have a, a laser at home called a laser saw, which is a large CO2 engra or cutter. Mm -hmm. And you know, kind of similar construction, also just similar in terms of how I'm presenting it in terms of an open source project with all of the all the details available. Oh, so this is going to be open source then? It is. It's already oh. available. Nice. Uh, the Fusion 360 project available. Step files and STL files for everything, both individually and as fully laid out print plates for those that want to just have one go. All the core components can be printed in one go on a 200 millimeter square print plate. Oh, it's nice. It's about a 20 hour print. Perfect. Um, the full bill of materials, and in about a week or two, the full build guide will be up. I awesome. still need to finish that with all the pictures and stuff. So tell me a little bit about the electronics of this, because you've got a custom board here for it, right? I do. So it's designed to be workable with pretty much any two axis, or even, I guess, theoretically, three axis uh, CNC laser control board, um, particularly you know, it's small, it doesn't need to be that fast, so Gerbil's per perfectly fine for it. Yeah. Um, I made a custom board that I call the Platypus, which is something that we're going to be selling later, um, indiv independently of uh, the Engravenator. But mm -hmm. it's designed specifically with the Engravenator in mind. Um, it's not a shield. The, the Atmega 328 is directly on the board. Uh, it'll handle Trinamics step stick style drivers. Nice. Um, with all of their jumper config pin options, awesome. which I don't think any other board does currently, uh, as far as I know. Um, and also screw terminals for everything. And also, it doesn't have a mini or micro USB port, which will break off. <laughs> nice. It's got yeah. you know the big full fat one that uh, is. It, it's meant to stand up to a, like a workshop environment. Awesome. You know, it can be thrown around and should be still be fine. Yeah. Yeah. I love that it's just the engraver, so you know, the Linux philosophy, do one yep. tool, one task, do it well. Yep. But you can just pick it up, place it on the thing you want to engrave, and then, yeah. and then engrave it. It's got a little cutout at the bottom that you just like, place on the thing you want to engrave. Yeah, there's actually um, there's sort of an optional panel for it which fits on the bottom that is sort of like a tar targeting reticule. Um, nice. it's, it's just got the cutout. It's, it's 135 millimeters square, and it's got tick marks along it. You can use that to sort of center it and get everything lined up. Um, and yeah, it was initially designed for woodworking, for like engraving your maker's mark on furniture or something like that. Awesome. Yeah. So what kind of software do you use to run this then? Uh, I personally use Lightburn. It's a preference. Um, it's Gerbil, so laser web, laser Gerbil, Carbide 3D, whatever, all that stuff works. Open builds, all their, all their stuff handles it. Awesome. So? so 
I guess you have plans for kits for these in the future? Uh, there has been enough interest that the kits is probably going to be a thing that will be coming. Um, you know, I just finished this, so I came here trying to figure out what the interest would be. It has yeah. been exceptionally high. So looking into building kits, just kind of trying to figure out what the pricing on it's going to be, how it can handle the pricing margins and all that. Um, but that's one of the reasons why we've had people signing up for the newsletter and yeah. you know, taking the information. Um, so I'm hoping we can do that. At the very least, you know, we'll be doing the control boards, doing the enclosure panels and all that, because um, the rest of the parts can be sourced if you want to. But we're hoping to hopefully have some sort of turnkey solution to be able to say, here's a box full of parts, you're good to go. Nice. So, yeah. so, so for those at home who want to follow the project, where do they go to follow that at? Um, engravenator.com is probably a good place to start. We're also on Twitter and Instagram, uh, at The Engravenator. Uh, so there's stuff on there. Um, from engravenator.com, you can also sign up for a newsletter to kind of get email updates on anything new that's happening with it. And that, engravenator.com will list to the GitHub repo and all the build guide and the bill of materials and everything there is nicely laid out. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, one final question. What did you use to model your parts in? Uh, it's all Fusion 360. Okay. Yeah. So like, it, when I say open source, I literally mean you can get the entire Fusion 360 file with, I think, up to now all 378 versions <laughs> of it that I've saved. <laughs> now, this is a long-running project, um, so you can modify them, do whatever you want with the full assembly. Uh, I even modeled in all of the motion for it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Nice. I got yeah. obsessive about it. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. yeah, well, thanks for taking time to talk with me today. No problem. Thank you. Yeah.